<clears throat> Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you speak to us from it today. Lord, we ask for strength. We ask for courage. Father, forgive each one of us for we failed you. Lord, help us to repent sincerely in our hearts, Lord. To turn from that sin and never return. Lord, help us to and dedicate our lives fully to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 12, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes to us, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, what does it mean to be dedicated? The dictionary, in the, in the first definition, said to devote to a sacred purpose. It gives us an example, a temple dedicated to Venus. For a temple dedicated to God, to Jesus and the Spirit. Where I used to work when I was in seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, we had what's called dedicated monitors and switchable monitors. That was in the day, of course, of the cathode ray tube instead of the, the flat screens we have today, but those, those cathode ray tubes, the CRT we called them. The dedicated monitor means that it had one camera with one picture constantly there. The switchable monitors, there would be many different cameras hooked to that one monitor and it would switch those scenes, go in between those different camera scenes. Whenever you only hooked one camera to one monitor, what would happen is the picture would burn into that dedicated monitor. In other words, you could turn the monitor off and still see the picture because it would had burned into it. That's the reason why you have uh, screensavers on your computer. Uh, if, if you left your computer on one particular piece of software or one particular uh, game or whatever, that picture would burn into the monitor and so the screensaver would kick in and put bubbles up there or whatever it was that, that the screensaver did to keep from burning a picture in. It's dedicated. And what it's dedicated to tends to burn into it. Let's examine the factors of dedication that Paul has given us in our passage of scripture this morning. First of all, he tells us that we're dedicated to a compelling motive. He uses that word, therefore. And whenever you see the word, therefore, you'll recall, you should figure out what, what is it, therefore. And this, therefore, points us back to the last 11 chapters, to the wondrous realities of the grace of God and justification, and in the power of the Spirit in sanctification, and Paul here urges Christians in view of what the Christian life is, it's a right standing with God, it's union with Christ in His death and resurrection, it's a new life in the Spirit, it's eternal security in the love of God. Paul encourages, he urges, it says, his fellow Christians on the basis of the mercies of God, it is these mercies which cause us, which compel us to dedicate ourselves to God. Christ died for us that we might live. And in this, we experience these mercies of God. And because of it, we're motivated to dedicate ourselves fully to God. Notice that self-dedication is never forced. It must always be a voluntary process. A voluntary response to God's love in Christ. Self-dedication. 
Imagine with me this morning that you're in a burning house and you can't get out. And so tension's rising, right? You're, you're upset. You're, you're afraid of, of the pain. You're afraid of what's going to happen. But fortunately, someone comes in and rescues you. They break down the door. They make a hole in the wall, whatever it took. They got to you and rescued you out of that burning building. What would your response be to that person? You'd be grateful. But, you know, especially if it was a fireman who did that, they only did what, what we would expect them to do. But back up a minute and suppose that person who rescued you actually gave their life in doing that. They lost their life in order to save you. Now what's your response? You know, you're very grateful. Extremely grateful. Words probably can't express your gratitude. You know, how can you repay that person now? You really can't. But what can you do? That's what Paul is saying. We were in a burning house. Our body doomed for hell. Might as well have been lit on fire already. But Jesus gave up his life for us. He gave up his life for me. He gave up his life for you. And Paul is saying we can't repay that. We cannot repay Jesus, but certainly we can dedicate ourselves to God because of what he's done, because of the mercy that he's shown us. We're to dedicate ourselves to be living sacrifices. We're to dedicate ourselves in that way. Dedicated to be a living sacrifice. Our, our dedication is is to be all-inclusive. Paul said to present your bodies. He didn't say give your arm. He didn't say give your money. He didn't say give your time or talents. He said present your bodies. Your body, of course, stands for the totality of your being. Your body, mind, and spirit. Paul made a similar appeal in, in chapter 6, verse 13. Present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This includes all our faculties, all our cap capabilities, all our capacities. But unlike the Old Testament slain offering, that dead animal offering, ours, Paul tells us, is to be a living sacrifice. We're not to, to give dead meat. Ours is presented on an altar of service. Ours, he says, is a holy sacrifice. We've been made holy by Jesus. We've been made acceptable. We've been set apart for a holy purpose. For a God-ordained purpose. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice and to offer all that we are to the service of God. Someone has said that we should serve with such utter abandon that our bodies are consumed in the expenditure of talent and strength for the cause of Christ. Such dedication is to be our spiritual worship, he says. In other words, when we give ourselves in holiness, when we give ourselves in service to Jesus Christ, our dedication becomes an act of worship. Oh, well, what we thought worship is what we've been doing in here, singing songs to Jesus. That is worship, but worship is more than that. It's giving our entire self to God. You see, we have the mistake of thinking that, you know, this is this is the, the leader, you know, up here. You know, this and, and the audience is out here, and, and so the music leader kind of directs it for a while, and the preacher kind of says stuff. But we've got the wrong idea if we think this is, you know, 
the audience out there and then stuff happens up here. We need to understand that God is the audience of all that we're doing. And all that we're doing is worship to God. When we give ourselves in holiness and service, our dedication becomes an act of worship. Just like the Jewish priests who daily offered sacrifices in the temple, we daily offer ourselves to the service of God. Not just on Sunday. Not just on the holy day. But every day of the week. How do we do this? All this sounds good and spiritual and, and nice, but how do we become living sacrifices to God? <clears throat> Well, it seems like the Bible tells us it involves us sharing our faith. It involves us responding to the commission Jesus gave us to go and teach others everything He commanded. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It involves sharing our faith. It involves devotion time in prayer and Bible study, spending time every day, sacrificing it to God as we read His Word and listen to what He would say to us and then share our hearts with Him. We devote family time, hopefully, to worship. We abandon earthly desires, put to death the deeds of the flesh, and seek the eternal and we'll find ourselves dedicated to live a new way, different from the way the world lives. We should look different from the world. People should look at us and, and say, they look, they're strange, they're different. Dedicated to live a new way. What does Paul say in verse 2 again? Do not be what? What does it say? Read it up there. Conformed to this world. Conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Instead, he says, be what? Transformed by you're doing something to your mind up here. You're renewing your mind. And in order to, and, and, and in doing that, then you prove what the will of God is. That which is good, that which is acceptable, that which is perfect. There's a world of difference that he's talking about here than what what oftentimes happens. He begins with the negative. Stop being fashioned. Stop being molded into the way this world wants to mold you. The pattern of the world, in other words. Don't accept the pattern of this age. There's a terrific pressure to do that. Amen? Peer pressure. It happens at all ages. It's not just when we're teenagers that we find peer pressure applied to us. But we're not to accept that peer pressure. We're not to accept the pattern of this age. Why not? What's wrong with the world? Well, what this world stands for is contrary to God. Have you noticed that? The world's standards are false and sinful. This world's God is Satan. We live in a pagan society. And Satan dominates this world. The Apostle Paul warns us in 1 Peter, or rather the Apostle Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5.8. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, not devour. Is Satan trying to devour you? Everyone should be saying, yes, he is. If you don't think he is, you are drastically mistaken. It's dangerous to adopt the practices of this world. This applies to your speech, your business practices, your personal habits, your recreation, your attitudes towards other people, your political attitudes, your attitudes towards money. The Christian is not of this world. He or she is a citizen of the kingdom of God. And, and Paul's positive appeal shows the difference. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. How can you renew your mind? Well, stop putting garbage in it. Start putting God's Word in it. You know? 
This means that, that you have a mind that's indwelt by Christ. The mind strengthened by the Holy Spirit. The mind committed to the ideas and ideals of the kingdom of God that you won't find on television. You won't find in the newspapers and the magazines of this world. You'll only find them in God's word. The key is putting to death the deeds of the flesh. How do you renew your mind? Stop conforming to the world. Find the will of God. Where is the will of God found? In His Word. The purpose of this spiritual transformation is so that we can test and find the will of God. In order that we can do the will of God, we have to find it. The will of God is the supreme good. The ultimate good. That perfect, acceptable thing that which brings the greatest degree of personal satisfaction and happiness and the greatest degree of spiritual achievement and the greatest degree of joy. I've shared with you all before that it's been said that computers are man-made brains. And I said it a while ago. Garbage in, garbage out. Right? Garbage in, garbage out. One day, as a mother was scraping and peeling vegetables for a salad. Her daughter came in, asked her permission to go to an amusement center that, well, it had a bad reputation. It was not a, not a good place. The daughter began on the, asfent, the defensive, of course. She, she admitted it was a questionable place, but all the other girls were going there. You know? Peer pressure is trying to bring its power against her. And as the, the teenage daughter pleaded to go to this place, she suddenly saw her mother pick up a handful of, of discarded vegetable peelings that she'd been working on, and she just tossed them into the sack. You know, the girl was shocked. She started, you know, crying, you know, mother, you're putting garbage into the salad. Yes. She replied, I, I know, but I thought that if you didn't mind garbage in your mind and heart, you certainly wouldn't mind a little garbage in your stomach. Thoughtfully, the girl began helping her mother re remove the offending material from the salad, and with a brief thank you to her mother, she went to tell her friends that she wouldn't be going with them. If you have a a case of spiritual indigestion and, and, and poor, a poor testimony, maybe it's because you've tossed too much garbage in the salad of your life. Garbage in, garbage out. It's true of man-made computers, it's true of God-made brains, and, and we allow into our minds, what we allow into our minds is what's going to come out of our mouths and out of our lives. If we allow the trash of pornography in, what should we expect to come out? If we allow the liberal philosophy of our world to come in, what should we expect to come out? If we allow our minds to be invaded by the will of God, that supreme good, that which is good and perfect and acceptable in God's sight, that's what will come out of our lives. What exactly does this mean? Kenneth S. West has an excellent translation in Actually, I would call it an interpretation of verse 2 here. He says, <clears throat> And stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, but is patterned after this age. But change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being by the renewing of your mind resulting in your putting to the test that which is the will of God. The good and well-pleasing and complete will, and having found that it meets specification, placing your approval on it. Again and again, Paul calls attention to this, to the Corinthians. He said in 2 Corinthians 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And to Titus, he said, in Titus 3, 5, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. 
by permitting God's Spirit to come in and renew our minds, we'll be able to test the will of God, and we will certainly find that it is good and acceptable and perfect. The minute that you and I assume a pose and pretend to be something that we're not, it's impossible for us to determine the will of God for our lives. But if we will yield to the will of God, we find that the will of God is actually good, fits us exactly, fits us perfectly. Have you ever put on a piece of clothing and you're like, yeah. Usually you don't find those at Walmart, but occasionally I found a few things that that's a good fit. It's first good, but then it's acceptable, and finally it's perfect, in, in, in that the believer's will and God's will are equal to each other. And you, you just can't improve on that kind of a situation. Paul could say, I can do all things, where? Through Him who strengthens me. The believer can do all things that are in God's will. It, it, it's wonderful not to have to act the, the part of being Christian, but just be natural and let the Spirit of God move and work through you. Hanley C.G. Moore put it like this. He said, I, I would not have the restless will that hurries to and fro, seeking for some good thing to do or secret thing to know. I would be treated as a child and guided where I go. Can you surrender to God as a child? All right, so to sum up what Paul has said here, <clears throat> Paul has told, told us that the secret to a holy life revolves around worshiping God through the sacrifice of our bodies, and through developing this mind of Christ in each one of us. And then Paul moves on to tell us that accomplishing these two things in our lives will enable us to carry out God's will for our lives in a way that honors Him. As we yield our bodies, yield our minds to Him, His will becomes more clear, more important to us. We acquiesce to it more frequently. And then he gives us this marvelous description of God's will that, that we just briefly brushed on. Paul uses three identifying objectives to describe the will of God that I'd like to briefly expand on each of these points before we finish this morning. First, he said that God's will is good. Regardless of what the Lord might ask us to do, we'll always find in the end it's good. It's, it's the devil and the flesh who tell us that the Lord's ideas will bring about hurt, will bring about problems. However, God will never ask us to do anything that's not for our eternal good. Anybody remember Romans 8, 28? Paul said, and we know that God causes all things, all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You remember Joseph's words to his brothers. They sold him into slavery. And then they found him in, in charge at Pharaoh's house. And Joseph said to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Sold into slavery, but God meant it for good. So don't be afraid of the will of God for your life because it is indeed good. Next, he said it is acceptable. Acceptable. What an interesting word. The, the Greek word is eurestos. And it means pleasing or well-pleasing. In other words, it's pleasant. God's will is pleasant. Pleasant in the sense that when His will is revealed to us, it's something that we're made willing to do. As we move through this life, God is in the business of maturing us, growing us. And as we grow, he, His demands on our lives change. Through the experiences of life, God grows us and matures us so that when 
His call comes and His will is revealed. We're equipped. We're ready for whatever He calls us to do. If His will at times seems unacceptable to us, then we're no doubt overlooking something that He's trying to show us. Something He's trying to mature us in. He'll never lead us to a place where we're not really, really ready to go. You remember Abraham in Genesis 22. You remember Israel and, and their wilderness experience. Only Joshua and Caleb seem to have learned the lessons well in the wilderness. All the people were equipped, but only two were willing to follow. When, when the nation of God refused to honor God by doing His will, instead of facing blessing, they faced judgment. When, God's, when God reveals His will to us, it's because He knows we're ready. When He shows us it's time to march forward without question, without reservation, we must stand to attention, salute, and advance. Finally, concerning God's will, Paul says it is perfect. There's nothing that you or I could add to God's will to improve it. When He reveals His will to us, we need to realize that God sees the end of the matter. Before it ever happens, God knows what will happen. He knows the path we'll take. He knows the obstacles, the valleys that we'll pass through as, as we go on our way. He knows where the provisions are that He has already placed for us along the way. His plan can't be improved upon, but it must be followed in order to achieve victory, in order to receive blessing. We can be in no better place than the perfect will of God for our lives. Amen. By yielding our bodies and our minds to God, we will be able to prove, or in other words, to live out God's will before a world that's looking Confused at us, really. When, when the world sees you and me living lives that are absolutely spiritual, they'll know that we've been transformed by the power of the gospel of, of grace, and they'll be intrigued. They'll want to know more about it. As a result of our getting where the Lord can bless us and use our lives, souls will be saved. God will be honored, will, will be an awe-inspiring weapon, mighty in the hand of God. We'll be proof positive to a doubting world that God can take the worst and make the best out of it. We'll be evidence of His power to a perishing world. And we'll finally be salt and light as we've been commanded to be by Jesus. Matthew 5. So the secret of living a holy life boils down to God having control of our minds, our bodies, our wills. Does that describe the life that you're living today? Is God in absolute control of all that you have and all that you are? First, are you sure that you're saved, that you've surrendered your life to Him to begin with? Second, is your mind being renewed by the transforming power of the Word of God so that the new man on the inside, the new woman who's been birthed in that transforming experience of surrendering to Christ in the first place, that new person is being permitted to live on the inside and therefore be shown to the outside. Third, have you discovered and surrendered to the will of God for your life every day? I want to live a holy life. What about you? I'm faced by the same trials and temptations you are, and I struggle with them like you do. But the question all of us must face this morning is, will we fully surrender our all to Him? Give it all to Him. Will you get serious about this thing of serving the Lord? Will you allow the Lord to transform you, transform your life into that which is good and perfect and acceptable?
Maybe we've not been doing so well until now, but today is the day we can start doing much better. Today, let's start serving. Let's start surrendering. If we looked at the list of Christian martyrs, those who died for their faith, we'd find that that list is very long in the history of the church. Men and women who followed the example of the Apostle Paul living a, a life following this Romans 12, 1 and 2 pattern. For all Christians, a, a commitment to offer oneself as a living sacrifice to God will often lead to persecution of some sort. But for Christian martyrs, that persecution comes full circle back to the point of sacrifice for the cause of Christ and ultimately giving your life. William Tyndall of England was such a martyr. Tyndall's English translation of the Bible is one of the sources that the King James Version of the Bible is based on. Tyndale was, was born near the end of the 15th century and, and lived until 1536. From an early age, he was consumed with a love for the scriptures. His mind was singularly addicted to them, it's been said. In the words of John Fox, a contemporary of, of Tyndale's in England, the author, of course, of Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is the source of, of the quotes that follow. But it wasn't head knowledge alone for Tyndale. His life reflected what he read in Scripture. Mr. Fox wrote that his manners and conversation matched the Scriptures. They were such that all who knew him described him as a man of the most virtuous disposition and of life unspotted. Life unspotted. Holy life. Pure life. Sounds like a man above reproach. A man who had offered his body as a living sacrifice to God. Tyndale, unlike most of the people in his day, had the kind of education. Well, he was educated at Magdalen Hall at Oxford University and Cambridge University. And his education allowed him to read the scripture in the original biblical languages and understand it. What I would give for such a, an education. But since in those days there was no English translations of the Bible available, Tyndale would instruct the, the learned and the unlearned in his clear understanding of what the scripture said from the reformer's perspective. And, and this naturally attracted the attention of those in the Catholic leadership who were beginning to seek out and persecute the Protestant factions in the country. And there was no moral charges they could bring against Tyndale. His life was pure and holy. His life as a living sacrifice left him unapproachable. The only charge they could bring against him was his teachings of the truth of God and ultimately his translation of that truth into the English language of his countrymen. When, when he was speaking with an educated Catholic scholar on one occasion, Tyndall's refutation of the man's teaching caused the scholar to blurt out, we were better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. Tyndale's zeal, not allowing for such heresy, was clearly seen in the response he gave, which certainly won him no favor with the established church, he responded, I defy the Pope and all his laws. He went on to say that if God spared his life, he would in time cause a boy that drives the plow in England to know more of the scripture than did the educated cleric. Ultimately, of course, Tyndall's life and sacrificial adher adherence to the truth of God cost him his life. In 1536, William Tyndale was tied to a stake, strangled by a hangman, and then burned in the fire by the decree of the emperor. But not before crying out from the stake, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Even to the end of, of his life, he lived as a sacrifice to God. In the year and a half he was in prison, before his death, he led the prison keeper, 
the keeper's daughter, and others of his household to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Tyndale was a man after Paul's own heart, a man after the heart of God. And while losing all his translation manuscripts in a shipwreck, having to start all over from the beginning while being pursued by secret agents, while enduring the police raiding his printer, while being betrayed to authorities by his friends, Tyndale remained faithful as a living sacrifice to God through everything that he had endured up to his death. All of us today who want to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God need to learn from Tyndale. But I'm afraid we never will because we've not experienced the kind of oppression that he went through. We don't even believe it's possible today, I don't think, but I'm afraid we'll see in years to come that it is. With sacrifice comes persecution and the requirement to love your enemies and possibly the call from God to lay down your life for the gospel, the ultimate sacrifice. What is coming out of my life? What is coming out of your life? The, the mercy of God should compel us to dedicate our lives to Him, Paul tells us. We should become a living sacrifice made holy by Jesus Christ, not conforming to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Where we're going to sing a song that says, Living for Jesus, you know it. The question is, are you living for Jesus? As we sing it, if you need to make a commitment to the Lord, a, a renewal to the Lord, you can come forward, kneel here at the, at the altar and pray and, and rededicate your life. All of us, no matter whether we come forward or not, need to make that rededication. We need to recommit <coughs> to finding the will of God for ourselves and living it out. Let's stand together as we sing the Lord.